Hi, this is Rachel from Hope Miami Lakes in Florida. This message of hope is for you. I like Miss Gloria's word game, word association game, so much I want to add to it. I mean, you went salt, then you guys said you went chips, and you said... So let me add one more to it. What if I said banana, what would you say? Check a look at this picture, because I'm going to change your perception of bananas. Yeah, now you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, bring up that banana picture for me, would you please? Because this picture that uh, was featured at Art Basel this last week is uh, now going to stand a little bit differently in your mind. You guys find that up there? Well, you know the one I'm talking about. It's the, uh, it's the yellow banana that's uh, duct tape to the wall. Now, that in itself would be kind of interesting, except that when I found out that that, that banana sold for $120,000, my concept, my idea of bananas was forever changed. Anybody could do that with a banana and make $120,000. And I, somebody had to buy it, right? What is wrong with that person? But, <laughs> but you know what's even more interesting? There it is. There's the picture of the banana. This is even more interesting than that. Yesterday, this is the part that finally got my attention. Yesterday, somebody came up, took the banana off the wall, and ate the dang thing, right? Word is out in the news that uh, the police are not going to persecute or prosecute either one of them because who really thinks that's worth 120000 bucks, right? It's a banana. And literally, the, the, the art form is that, you know, when the banana gets old, you put a new banana up there. Isn't that fascinating? But you get a different perspective of bananas, like salt and pepper and chips and salsa, banana and or basil, right? And I got another one for you to think about. When I say the word Moses, what image pops into your mind? What's that? A Ten Commandments. When you think of Ten Commandments and Moses together, what image pops to your mind? Willie would tell you Charlton Heston was the one that pops in your mind, right? Yeah, I, in fact, I got the same problem. I think of Ten Commandments, Moses, boom, Charlton Heston. Now, that's, it's true. We get images that get stuck in our heads. We get ideas that get stuck in our head. And in the same way, our faith can get frozen in place, can get stuck in one place. Well, I, that's not the way God wants you to live your life. God wants you to have a dynamic, changing, growing faith. And so today I'm going to look at this story that we found in Exodus chapter 3, which is a story about Moses who, who had a very... Mm, eye-opening experience that changed his life. And we're going to use that as the template for us to learn more about how we can get unstuck or if we're not so stuck, how do we can move our faith along even, um, even faster and more, and more uh, deeply. So let's go to the Word of God before we get started and make sure our minds and hearts are ready to hear God's Word. Will you join me in reciting our Bible commitment statement? This is God's Word given to help me know and love God. I will read it, live by the teaching Jesus gave us, and use it to change lives and build community for Christ. I'm going to be reading, as I mentioned, from Exodus chapter 3. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the desert, and he came to Oreb, the, the mountain of God. And there the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames and fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, well, I'll go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. And when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Now, as the story continues, we find out a little bit more about the mission that, uh, that uh, Moses is about to get because he tells Moses, listen, I've been hearing the pleas, the cries, the whimpering, the chorus of, of hurt that's happening in Egypt. I hear it, and now I am going to solve their problem because I am sending you. And the scripture began, keeps going. So now I go, I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to the God, who am I that I should go to the Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I'll be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. 
And Moses said to God, said to God, Suppose though I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask, What is his name? Then what shall I tell them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And this is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. Now this particular verses of Scripture in, in uh, Exodus 3 is, has so much we could talk about. But what I want to use as our template for discussion are some items on here that are going to help us get our faith unstuck. Right? And starting with this, and I think this is really an enlightening one, Right off the bat, uh, we learned a little bit more about Moses than we knew before. Because when Moses' story ended, after he had killed the, uh, the man that was brutalized in one of the Hebrews, the, it, everything goes kind of, it's kind of silent. We don't know, learn much about Moses at all. But all of a sudden, we get to this point, and we learn that now he's a shepherd, and that he's been around a while. Well, how long do you think Moses has been around at this point? Take a guess. 80 years. He's 80 years old. Well, wait a minute. Moses is 80 years old. Most people, when they hit the age of 80, all they're thinking about doing is retirement. All they're thinking about doing is kicking back and not doing anything. And yet Moses says, so now go. Which ought to tell you something. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter how young you are. When God says go, it's time to get up and get going. I'm here to tell you that with your last dying breath, you should be working for Jesus. That's what I believe. I really believe that from the bottom of our heart that we need to be hear the call on our hearts and respond to it no matter where we are, no matter what we're feeling, no matter what's going on in our life. That's the way I'm walking. And I'll tell you, you when you walk that way, you're going to experience God in a way you couldn't imagine possible. But you know what happens, though? The truth is when you get to be 80 or seasoned or beyond that, uh, sometimes we get, a little, we get a little bit locked into the way we think. But it's not exclusive to older folks. Younger people do the same thing. They come new to their faith, and what they learn, they stop. Either way, it's not good. It's not a healthy place to be. God expects us to keep changing and keep growing all the time. And, and, and in doing that, we have a way of getting closer to God that helps us get unstuck from wherever we might be. Now, now listen to this, though. Sometimes locking in to what God tells us to do is vital and important. God gave us the Ten Commandments, Right? Of course, the image of Moses pops in your head of Charlton Heston, but, you know, beyond, above and beyond that. He gives us the Ten Commandments, and we're expected to follow them. And some people do, to the letter of the law, at least the best of their ability. But you know what the truth is? I've never met anybody that's really lived those Ten Commandments out completely, absolutely, in perfection, the way God calls us to do. Anybody ever miss church this last year? Anybody ever uh, use the word uh, God's name in vain? Anybody here have a struggle with anybody in your family or you're struggling with loving people the way we're called to do? Have you have any struggle loving God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength? You get the idea? Nobody quite lives up to that. That's why Jesus says the Ten Commandments is an excellent starting point. It's not the end point. It's a starting point because what we're called to do goes above and beyond that. And the reason I'm sharing this with you is because when you live above and beyond just the basics, you get closer. And the closer you get, the more you grow and change and, and, and become more like Christ. So listen, one of the obstacles is your pride. Let me, let me restate that. The biggest obstacle in your life for growing and changing is your pride because you don't think you need to grow. You don't think you need to change, young or old. A lot of people get in that cycle of thinking, I'm good. I know it. I know what I need to know. I'm fine. That's your pride talking. And your pride will keep you from actually growing. It will freeze you in, the, in your tracks. It's quite the opposite. So you need to let that pride go and, and, and fully experience Christ the way it's intended. But sometimes, lesson two, sometimes we need a little wake-up call. Um, favorite morning drink. What's your favorite morning drink? Coffee. Some people like coffee. I like one cup of coffee. That's all I can handle. Some people like them little shots, right? Cafecitos. And uh, you love the way I say that, right? Cafecitos. Some people like the bigger shots, what are called what? Uh-huh, uh-huh. I don't even know the name of those things. I drank one of those, I'd be bouncing off the wall. Can't drink them. 
But the thing is, we need little wake-up calls in our lives to get the ball rolling, right? Well, Moses had a wake-up call. What was his wake-up call? It was a burning bush. We need them. We need them sometimes really, really desperately to finally get our faith going. And the Bible is full of people that got wake-up calls. For example, Paul got his wake-up call. Lightning bolt comes. Because when we get these big-time wake-up calls, things can change. I got a wake-up call from God. Wasn't quite a burning bush. Wasn't quite a lightning bolt, but it was one that, I'll never, that changed me forever. I got what I needed because I'm very stubborn, and God knew he needed to communicate with me in a way that I would listen. But sometimes God will give us wake-up calls in more subtle ways and sometimes more, even more impactful ways, like uh, people who have had a heart attack. All of a sudden, oh, my gosh, maybe I should change my life. Maybe I should stop eating as much as I do or the wrong things. Or maybe I need to come closer to God. We get wake-up calls. Sometimes it's financial. Sometimes it's relational. We need wake-up calls. you got to get changed, and God will give them to you. The question that all that remains is, will you listen to the wake-up call? Will you hear God's call in your life to change and make your life better and different, more Christ-like? Because that's how you get unstuck. You hear the wake-up calls, and you respond to it. Now, I mentioned getting closer. I've been mentioning it over and over, getting close to God. You know, when Moses came face to face with God, that boggles my mind. Just think about that for a minute. I mean, face to face with God, as much as he could, face to face with God, being in the presence of God at that proximity and at that moment, being that close, what did Moses feel? Fear. Fear. Now, his knees might have been trembling, but this is not like, you know, chainsaw massacre fear. This is, you know, somebody running after you with a big, you know, big knife or something. Not, not, uh, not that kind of fear. It's the fear and awe of being in the presence of the Almighty. Now, think if you could wrap your mind about being in the presence of the creator of the universe. Get your mind wrapped around the idea of the guy that invented Christmas. Get your mind wrapped around the guy that controls climate and, and, and the seasons and, and controls life itself. You're going to have a little face-to-face -face time with that creator. Would you be in awe at that moment? I would hope so. I would hope that you would feel that presence and go, wow! And when you get that close, when you get that close, you acquire, and in Moses' case, he acquired some more knowledge about, clock, about God. In other words, the closer you get to God, the more knowledge you acquire. And Proverbs 9.10 says this, uh, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You get in the front of God, you get next to God, it's the beginning of wisdom. And knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. We are saturated with knowledge you got I see some of you got them right now at your fingertips your phones and you're looking for more knowledge I myself am uh, or you're looking at emails I don't know which it is but or you're taking notes God bless you for saying that you're taking notes thank you but you know we have at our fingertips access to so much knowledge isn't that true in fact, I, now my, honestly, my conversations that go, well, I don't know that, let me look it up, right? We don't go without knowing things. We don't, we don't go through life without understanding. We want the knowledge. And today, compared to 100 years ago, your kids, our kids, my kids, have so much more information than 100 years ago, it's not even funny. You think of all the way things have changed, all the, how our understanding of things have changed the last 100 years. And we get it on a phone instantly. But guess what? Just because you got knowledge don't make you the smartest person in the room, does it? And you know what? Having knowledge is a lot like fool's gold, right? It looks really pretty, but it might not be worth any more than that banana on the wall. You know what I'm talking about? Because knowledge unto itself is important, it's vital, it's helpful, but it does not get you closer to God only unto itself. It's got to be in context. Knowledge and context that comes from the Bible. Knowledge and context that aligns you with God, that helps you on your journey. Now, that's valuable. That's helpful. So getting to know God, getting close to God, getting godly knowledge, getting smarter about God, understanding God will help you get unstuck, unfrozen from wherever you are. Amen? Amen? Yes, it will. Which leads me to the, another point that is important. Move it or lose it. I, I know 
as I continue to find myself incrementally, slowly but surely getting older, that this is so true. You ever rode around in a car for a long time, like, you know, like uh, three or four hours? You get out of the car and you go, oh, oh, ah, ah, and your bones are creaking when you get out of the car. You know what I'm talking about? Well, if you don't, you will. Eventually, you'll all face that. And it's the truth. If you don't move it, you lose it. Your ability to move and walk and to function. And, and the same applies with our faith, right? If you're not using it, if you're not pointing it to work, if they, if they throw down palm branches for you and give you a royal welcome, you are not a boring person. If you get people to sacrifice their own lives for you, you are not boring. If, you, if you're not boring, if you can inspire others, you're not boring if you can change the world. Unbelievable to some people, being a Christian is the opposite of being boring. It's the only life that's worth living. I used to live 100% in the world. I used to be a 9 to fiver. Well, never was that. But I used to work a lot, right, for the world. And I get to the end of the day and I go, oh, man, I got nothing left to take. I get up in the morning and go, geez, I don't know. How, I'm going to need a cafe colette or a couple of shots to get going. I have got now, being a, being a follower of Jesus Christ, dedicating my life, I've got more energy in my one little finger than I had in my entire life before that point. I am nonstop. I don't know why. Well, I do know why. I know who I'm working for, and I'm excited about doing it every single day. Unbelievable amount of energy that I get from being a follower of Jesus Christ. I can't tell you any more than that. I'm living it. But that's yours. But that's yours. You don't have to be frozen. You don't have to be stuck. You don't want to keep, you know, you got to move it or you're going to lose it. But you don't have to do that. You can choose to do something different. But I know, I know, I know, I know what you're saying. I know what you're thinking. Yeah, but that is so scary to do that. We're not alone in that. Moses was afraid. I think he was tentative. I think he was saying, yeah, but, you know, you know God, I know you're calling on me to get going, but that's above my pay grade. I'm 80. I can't do that. And, and God just said it so beautifully, so powerfully. He gave it to him in a way that I think everybody can hear. He says, but, Moses, I am with you. I will be with you along the way. You do not walk alone in this journey. You do not have to struggle by yourself. You do not have to face fear or anxiety by yourself. You don't have to face obstacles. You don't have to face depression by yourself. You don't have to do anything alone you, because God says, I will be with you. And now you know this for the truth. Now Moses didn't know the rest of the story. He didn't know about the sacrifice that Jesus made. He didn't know about God's track record. He was a part of the record. But we look back and say, God is always truthful. God always says what he means and means what he says. Amen? So we know this. And so when he says, go, when he says go, will you respond like Moses did? When he said, send me. Now, isn't that really the question for today? Isn't that really the bottom line truth is that when God gives you your burning bush, when God gives you the tools and the gifts and everything you need, and he says, go, will you receive that and do as he calls you to do? You don't really have a lot of excuses. In fact, you have none. So much to gain and so much to lose by not responding to that call. And you don't walk alone. He loves you so much. He died for you. He walks with you. He hears your pain. He hears your cries, just like the ancient Israelites. He hears all of that. He knows what your needs are. And he will walk with you and nurture you and love you all the way, all the time. Let's pray about that. Holy Father, this is a, a day that you've given us, and it is filled with joy today. It's filled today with joy because we have the power of the knowledge of your love. We have the power of not only the knowledge of your love, but of the presence of your love. Through the Holy Spirit and your grace, Father, you have filled us and will continue to fill us. You will fill us to overflowing if we simply accept you into our hearts today completely. Break down the barriers. Surrender. Stop saying no, but say instead, send me. 
In the name of Jesus Christ, the Holy and Powerful One, God and Father Almighty, I just pray that upon each and every one here today that you receive His Word this way. In Jesus' name we pray, and if you love Him, say as one voice, Amen. Amen. God bless you, and have a very M-A-R-Y Christmas, okay? Amen. Amen. Amen.